Hey, everybody, it's Saster. Uh, Jason Lemkin here. Uh, I've got a great founder and CEO today with us, Michael Greenwich from Work OS. And we're going to do this new series that I've been wanting to do for a while called What's New At, where we talk to some of our leading friends and partners about what they're seeing in markets that are of interest to all of us. And Work OS is, a, is doing a couple of things. First of all, Michael, I want to keep going, but thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be great. I want to just frame this a little bit. We'll talk about the company, but solving some problems that I think are important to all of us today, which is going more enterprise, making it easy, how that works. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm personally very passionate about everything around security and going enterprise, because I think we should just do all the stuff immediately. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I think if you can do enterpriseification, I know this, I've made this term up, but if you can do this through an API, if you can do it in a week, in a day, in an hour, do it because... Uh, every big customer now is right to demand security, all different types of security that we'll talk about. And just do it. Don't argue about it. Get it done. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then I want to talk a little bit about selling to developers and what that means today and a little bit about PLG. And then we'll we'll run out of time. But those are some fun topics. But Michael, before we get there, frame it a little bit. I know you've been doing this for a while. Tell us about how big work OS today and what your well, like what, what your sweet spot, what your what's your number one problem that you solve today? Yeah. So work OS is a developer platform to make it really easy to become enterprise ready. Um, that's what we put on our homepage. That's kind of what we lead with. What that really means is adding all the features to your app that you need to go sell to those enterprise customers. Things like single sign-on, SAML authentication, you know, skim provisioning for user management, all this stuff that enterprise folks will ask for. Yes. And really it's it's for like um, deploying your app to a larger user base. So you could go sell to 20, 30, 50 person companies all day. But when you want to go start selling to hundreds of you know, people in a company, you're going to need this stuff. Um, and WorkOS helps you get it in really fast. Um, we integrate with all the major services. Literally, you can do it in a couple of days instead of it taking months and months and months of engineering time. Um, the company is about four and a half years old. Uh, we have around 400 some customers. We've raised, I think, close to $100 million. A bunch of household names you might know, like Loom, Modern Treasury, Plaid, Brex, Netlify, yep. uh, SecureFrame, Drata, Webflow, you know, Vercel, tons of these Good guys. Ones. All the powered cool by WorkOS. Um, okay. And so we help them go up market and go go after those enterprise customers. And just just because I this is a topic I care about, I'm a little nerdy on it. Tell me today in, in 2023, the state of the art, like for when you close bigger customers, um, everyone needs enterprise grade single sign-on. Like, can you even get away without it today? It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. You can't it, it, you can't use just Google login or other credentials. You have to have true single sign-on to close a, a, a six or seven figure deal, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I yeah. would say even, you know, like mid five figures, low, low to mid five figures, you'll see it. Yeah. Um, what has happened here is that these features that used to be enterprise for really big yeah. companies, they've moved downstream. So smaller companies have been become more sophisticated around the tools that they use, the IT systems they have, automation around, you know, onboarding and offboarding people. And all yes. of that has resulted in needing to plug this stuff into the tools that you're using. COVID and actually work from home was this huge accelerant of it. We, we jumped forward probably five years in the sophistication around IT systems that are out there. So yep. it's, it's almost a misnomer to call them enterprise features because it's really just like B2B features, like commercial features if you're building. That's you know, the point tasks. that I'm passionate yeah. about. You, these have become table stakes, right? They, totally. they may still yeah. be in the enterprise column on your pricing page. You can you upsell them. That's for it. sure. Yeah. You yeah. can definitely upsell it from an individual and folks are willing to pay more for this stuff because it drives forward so much more value and security for them. But yep. not having these, uh, it's pretty much a non-starter. Um, you know, if you don't have these in your app, you're going to have a really, really hard time competing uh, with incumbents that do. Yeah, you got you got it. It's, it's, it you, I, I think these are year one features today in in the world we're in, right? Unless you're extremely small business, it's year one feature, right? Um, yeah, the things I usually say when people say what what's the earliest that people need work OS, I say, hey, when do you get product market fit? You know, if you're yeah. a brand new company and you just have some people kicking the tires and just exploring the product, maybe not then. But as soon as you start getting real users, you know, if if you have a say like a buddy that works at Coinbase and and you had a bunch of free users and some small teams, but your friend at Coinbase wants to start using it with their team, you're going to need to have those enterprise features, even if that's one customer of yours. Um, and so yep. you need to get it in sooner. It's one of the reasons why WorkOS, we've designed it to be really easy to integrate. You don't have to talk to sales. You can put in a credit card. You know, it's a, it's a SaaS native product so that even smaller organizations can use it and not have to go through the, the typical process that a big, you know, kind of enterprise infrastructure type of product would have. I want to come back to that next, sure. the second yeah. point, but just passion. And tell me, 
the other another part that you automate is multi-factor authentication, right? And it's just interesting because this space just keeps changing, right? You can't multi-factor used to be way on the right hand of your pricing page, right? Then it became mainstream. Now we're overwhelmed with authenticator apps on our phone and and worried that our SMS, our SIM cards are going to get hijacked. And uh, you know, eleven factors in you know where where my dog went to high school. What is the close <laughs> just practically for for executives and CEOs and founders? What do what is the state of the art today? What do customers demand? Oh man. Well, it's still changing, actually. That's a big yeah. thing. So multi-factor auth, you know, is this thing to augment the credentials that you already have. So that either binds it to a device or some biometrics or something, yeah. something, so, you know, something that other than what you know. They say what you know is your your password, you know, something you know, and then something you have is like a device, and then something you are is your biometrics. That could be your thumbprint. It could be face ID on your phone. Combining all these things together, that's what we mean by multi-factor auth. It's changing a lot. I mean, just recently this year, Apple introduced um, pass pass keys, I believe, which could be yeah. natively generated inside of iOS. The WebAuthn and Fido Alliance are creating more hardware security devices. Um, you know, the stuff you're talking about with authenticator apps, where you have to scan that QR code, that's that's changing a lot. One password, the company is doing a lot of cool stuff around this too. Yeah. So I I think one of the things is probably by the time this podcast airs, there might even be something new <laughs> that's come out. But the the desire is still there, right? Around augmenting passwords to reduce or hopefully eliminate phishing, and it's even more important with the wide proliferation of SaaS within B two B you know w- workflows. That's that's it really is. why we're adding this. It's not just signing into your Twitter or Facebook. It's signing into mission critical workplace apps. Where, where people are having attacks, and this helps mitigate that. Let me just ask you one one question. Uh, imagine a two by two where uh, I, I sure I, I think you are too. I'm so passionate about ease of use, right? Everything Absolutely. is magical. It's Absolutely. not everything, but it's close to everything, right? Ease of use plus every feature plus a great go to market team. Now that is everything. So how do you? Where is the two by two if you're selling to bigger customers between ease of use and like all this multi factor SSO stuff? Where it What's the least I can get away with that is still secure, that still checks the box for the enterprise? How can I combine that with ease of use? Man, that's a really good question. Um, you know, for us, I think what what I find is when you actually go sell to the bigger enterprise customers, you need to go into their systems. Yeah. So you need to integrate with what identity system they're using. That could be Okta, it could be Microsoft, you know, Azure AD, it could be OneLogin or Ping Identity or VM Warehouse stuff. It could, there's this huge fragmentation of identity solutions. But you need to go to them rather than providing your own custom home-baked way that you think it's secure. You yeah. essentially need to meet them on their their turf. And I think this is a it's kind of a fundamental mindset mindset shift you need to make as a founder is that you don't necessarily know everything. Say you're a you know smart product focused you know engineer minded founder trying to innovate. Sometimes you just got to meet the customers where they are and plug into the systems that they have have today, even if that's not the most bleeding edge of you know what's available um, yep. technology wise. For better okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about selling to developers. I know you're passionate about the topic, but it's interesting when I've watched what's happened to Twilio over the years in terms of selling to multiple stakers. When I've talked with Jeff about it, when we've had Todd McKinnon from Okta talk about different things here, it's not you have four customers now, so that's material, but it's not monolithic the sale to developers typically in twenty in this year. So you are, are you have four hundred customers. Do you always come through the developer, and do they? Do they own everything through the buying decision or are there multiple stakeholders? How does your PLG motion work here? That's a really great question. Yeah, I, I call this developer-led growth, DLG, because it's very different okay. than the PLG freemium type of thing. I think when selling to developers, you got to throw a lot of the typical SaaS best practices out the window. Um, some of the things are the same in terms of ease of use and sign up and get a free account or what have you. Um, but developers notoriously don't want to talk to anyone ever. They're they're willing to spend they don't, six right? figures yeah, they and don't. beyond. Yeah. We have we have people who have self served into contracts spending you know over ten thousand dollars a month that have never talked with us and never talked to sales. That yeah. is unheard of in other SaaS categories, right? It's just weird. And so there's there's things around that around the sales process and the motion or on onboarding them, supporting them, answering questions with a really deep insight around the technology that are that they're asking about. Um, you really have to frame the whole organization around it. Our number one operating principle as a company is developer joy. We, yeah. we, we talk about this all the time. And it's it's that ease of use to almost an extreme degree in everything we build. Um, I, I think it's really hard to bolt on or repurpose into a company that hasn't been built around this. Um, and it's a challenge to scale. 
you know, like you were saying, like we have, you know, four and some customers today, we're getting pulled up market. And so we have more and more typical sales conversations, but it does always start with the developer. Yeah. And the developer needs to always say yes. Something I believe in the ecosystem right now is if the developer doesn't like it, they can veto it. Developers have an outsized ability to well, that's the right that's decisions. a good insight right they can yeah. veto it right they can veto it they have an outside even if they don't write the check in the end they have outsized yes. influence throughout the entire process so if you can capitalize on that great that can be an amazing way to accelerate your business but if you don't serve them you got to watch out because they can swap things out or switch it out and they will turn on a dime <laughs> yes you know i think that's one of the things with Julio. you know you you're you're kind of only as good as your last show and unless you keep investing in that developer love, um, you won't keep reaping the rewards of it. And is there, um, is it, do you have, when with your bigger customers, do you have multiple stakeholders come into the deal for the bigger deals? And who are they? Is it, um, is it product? Is it finance? Like who gets dragged in beyond the developer and bigger deals of anybody? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, developer will sign up and plug it in because they'll say, Hey, there's a Jira ticket for adding SAML. I got to do this. Ugh, I don't want to build that. I don't even want to learn what SAML stands for. Let me just sign up for the service and plug it in. Yeah. Developers love doing that. You know, I need to send SMS. I'm going to go use Twilio. I need payments. I'm going to use Stripe. Same mindset. It's very different for engineering leadership who's thinking, hey, how do I put a not, not have to put a whole team behind this? I don't want to have to resource multiple engineers this year on this problem that might even have security you know, constraints. I don't want to deal with that. So that's a yeah. stakeholder. Um, the head, head of product, you know, VP of product, they'll say, hey, we have an enterprise roadmap around new real functionality we want in the app. I don't want to derail my roadmap because I have to add this user provisioning stuff or these access control permissions. I want us to work on, you know, whatever real product features are. Even the head of sales, you know, who doesn't understand what SAML means, isn't going to go <laughs> learn. They, they just know that's, a, you know, some word that keeps coming up. Enterprise features lacking them is it's probably one of the biggest sales objections that that person has. And so yeah. even they become a stakeholder saying, hey, we need to get either these features in or use WorkOS in order to unlock this next stage of our growth. So th there's a lot of different stakeholders as the company gets you know, larger and it's a bigger decision. I didn't even talk about like, you know, compliance or security teams evaluating it as a vendor. Like we're a critical vendor. And I think that's that's one of the challenges for us as we're evolving is how do we build a go-to-market function that can really satisfy all these people? And it's not just yeah. anymore the developer writing code with the API key. They're still there. But there are just more people in addition to them around the table. You know, I, 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 the compliance one we didn't talk about, I didn't think about how you are an arrow in some of the CRO's quivers in the sense they don't want to lose deals, right? Due to, due to not checking boxes. They don't really care at some level whether the product is compliant or secure, but they certainly want every box checked going into a deal. Are you, have you come up with collateral or even marketing or other ways to empower them? Yeah, we have a bunch of stuff that we can show the like the impact that this has. I mean, for a developer building up like a vendor, you know, creating a product, adding yeah. something like SAML auth, you know, it just sounds like one feature. If you make that a differentiating feature for your enterprise tier, you can go upsell this to customers like crazy. You we've can beat people, every vendor that doesn't have it. We've had people put it in their right. product the next month, go to an extra million in revenue. No yeah. joke. Just like overnight with just one feature. You know, it's it, it's a Sometimes people people say WorkOS is this API for SAML and skim and stuff. And I sometimes joke, no, it's an API to increase your TAM. It's an API to I, increase I your so. ARR, you know? I think um, so. And that's kind of the magic of it as a product. And that's that's why someone in a in a sales role, it clicks with them and they get it. If you know, it's still a technology solution at the end of the day, but but really we try to drive forward that business value and impact to folks. Yeah, it doesn't work in every category, but if you're in a especially if you're in an emerging category. And you can be the most enterprise vendor. You can just, I've written about this over the years. You can, not only you can just run away with deals, but you can anchor your pricing super high because Absolutely. enterprise customers can, I don't care if you're 10, 100,000 or 400,000, I need the enterprise product. And SAML's a great check the box feature, right? You don't have it um, or you can't pass these other audits. I'm out. Even if I have to pay 4X, they're not going to care at a Fortune 500 don't, company. Don't pay it. Yeah. It's and kryptonite can... to do that startup without it, right? They don't want to touch it unless... There's no other vendor available, right? Absolutely. And if you can anchor at that high price, you can do other things with yeah. your sales team that smaller PLG you know, companies can't do, right? Because they can't yes. afford that CAC or whatever. Um, and those contracts are really sticky. They're not going to churn. Yeah. They're going to stick around for a long time. And so it's a, it is a great, you know, this, I, I call this crossing the enterprise chasm going up market. I gave this talk a few years ago about this, how, you know, there's this category of products where there's the consumer version and then the enterprise version. Cause it was so hard for people to jump past this and sell the enterprise, like the yep. Dropbox versus box, you know, or Slack versus Microsoft teams. 
what WorkOS lets you do is cross that chasm, go from the PLG bottom up motion to enterprise really fast, really, really fast. Yeah. So you don't, you know, open the opportunity for someone else to come take that market from you. You can be the one to be the enterprise version of your app. Yeah, I love it. I got to tell you, if I were launching a new B2B app today uh, and I could get all this stuff from my API, I could go to WorkOS and, 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 and other vendors and I can get SAML and single sign-on and multi and I can have all of this, everything on, on the right-hand column, all the stuff. That's what it is. Stuff, it's the enterprise pricing everything. column. Go yep. to any pricing page, you see it's asked in that right-hand column. And I could have it on day one. And when I launched, this would be part of my secret superpower as a CEO doing this a third time, because you'll just win these deals or in a new category, you'll win them, right? Or in an existing category, you won't lose them. That's you right. You, the last thing you want to do is, wow, the, the fact that you have generative AI and the cool mobile, it's so cool, but oh my God, you just don't, you don't have the, this, you're out, right? And it's just going to happen. And if the fact that you can get this through an API in 20, these days, it's, um, it's it's a gift for founders. I think and you this only kind of pay stuff. for it's what you gift, use, right? You know, yeah, like that's the thing. You put in a credit card, you can just get started with one customer. We want it to be democratized, right? Really yeah. easy to get started, and uh, and you don't have to wait to do enterprise. Like one of my yeah. favorite customers, just you know, uh, helped help launch this year is Jasper. Jasper is this yeah. AI company. Yeah, and, we're you know, a customer. They're, they're building a ton of stuff, but the reason that they're able to the Jasper for AI is going to be Jasper, or excuse me, the Jasper AI for enterprise is just going to be Jasper. It's not going to be another company. Because WorkOS is able to enable them to go sell to those companies right away, and they can keep focusing That's a good on the case AI study. technology. That's right a good, my ima- yeah. I don't know the guys directly, but I would imagine they've grown so quickly without without an API or service, they might not be able to do it. And, and we want might, them focused they, they on the AI stuff. Yeah, they you might know, be they overwhelmed. They should keep focused right? on the AI stuff, and we'll do the enterprise yeah. stuff. Because the them. traction they've had and some of their peers in the enterprise, now that I think about it, shocking. Because you've got to check all the boxes, right? It's a, it's a non-starter if you, if you don't them, got right? it. You know, you're, you're just yeah. you're you're toast. But if you got this stuff in, it ends up becoming kind of like rocket boosters for your business. You know, if you have product market fit, passion. if you have the best offering, and you put this stuff in it, you can go sell to the Fortune 500 tomorrow. There's appetite to buy. That's the biggest difference from 10 yeah. years ago. Now these guys at the Fortune 500, they're excited about SaaS. They want to buy it. They know it's transformative to their productivity and their businesses. But they have to have these features in it. If they don't, it's it's they can't even bring it, you know, into the office. It's good. There's two, yeah. And then I want to hit just two more things before we run out of time. There's two, there's two secret things most founder, a lot of CEOs don't get. If you're the most enterprise vendor, you can win deals, even if you're mediocre on other parts of that matrix. And not not prior conversation. The other secret sauce is localizing early. If you localize yep. you early and you're, yep. no yep. one else does, no one else is localized. You will win a different set of deals that people won't even get. They won't even realize why you won that deal. These are like secrets repeat founders know is that going enterprise early and localizing early, you know, 50% of SaaS sales is outside of North America and 80% of the revenues in the enterprise. So if you can do this in year one instead of year seven, um, you know, one of my favorite investments is you know, early companies involved with this greenhouse. I love them. They're doing 200 million, they'll IPO. But I just saw today they went, they localized the product. I'm like, I can't believe all this year. Like, imagine that go, long. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm sure it's just priorities in the space they're in, but do these two things and, you know, do all the check boxes in enterprise vacation and localization, and you will beat 95% of folks. Um, so, one other thing I wanted to get just because you brought it up before we started, and sometimes you think this has faded away today, but it hasn't, which is build versus buy, right? So it, it, it's it's ama- this is one of these things that frustrates folks until you get big enough and it fades away because then it just becomes part of your sales cycle. But what have you learned from that for folks that think they can cobble together some solutions? I mean, you can deploy WorkOS in a week, so I don't know why you would build, but I but you still see some of that in the market, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm an engineer by training. I've I've been on the other side of that. You know, I've yep. seen stuff and been like, I could build this, or I know there's this open source stuff I could try, and yeah. so I get it. I get it. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons we made WorkOS so easy to use, and there's really no strings attached. Like you can put in the credit card, just use it for one customer forever. That's it. You don't have to yep. a big contract you have to sign. So we try to make it just so easy to test and have that experience um, that you can get the value out of it at that point. Um, you know, when people ask me about build versus buy long term, I'm I'm kind of like, you know, if you went back ten or fifteen years and you talked about building a data center. You know, it yeah. used to used to be the kind of thinking that once you started spending a hundred thousand dollars a month on AWS, you know, a million dollars a year, you'd build your own data center, rack your own machines, go do that kind of stuff. Because it was like at that point, you know, AWS gets expensive. You can hire an engineer to do it yourself, etc. I think what happens is the goalposts keep moving constantly, and that's really hard to forecast when you're making this decision. You know, today there's companies that spend over ten million dollars a month on AWS, and instead, like you know. 
uh, like Lyft is entirely on AWS and Pinterest and Stripe. They spend tremendous yep. amounts on it. And it, re- it removes the need for them to hire you know, engineers to build this stuff, build data centers, buy machines, but also like hire executives and talent to actually keep pace with this. Essentially, they've de-risked their business around the component of needing to have the best infrastructure in the world. They just get the best product possible. Yeah, I would never build anything today myself, you know, but, but, and, it, but it still comes up, right? It's still... yeah. But I think it's just really hard to forecast that forward to think like, hey, is this actually the thing that's going to move the needle in my business and be the differentiator or not? And yep. uh, 99.99% of the time, it's not. Um, and and uh, uh, and that, that's the case with AWS. It's definitely the case with WorkOS. I think it's the case with pretty much every other infrastructure offering. Just to follow up on one thing you said, because it's, 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 it's interesting and it's something that the developer-focused companies I've helped or invested in, I've seen where it gets complicated for pricing is when the companies get big. What have you learned? Like, it's easy to start off cheap, right? Uh, Datadog starts off cheap, but and then you could spend 15 million a year. Mongo totally. starts off yeah. free, right? And then everyone's spending a million. And sometimes I think Mongo has gotten it just right, near as I can tell from the outside. Um, Datadog is as good as it gets, but there is some friction from their bigger customers. Uh, and I've seen a few folks where there's a lot of friction getting that. What have you learned? How do you attack pricing? It's easy to get started for free and cheap, but how do you think about it as the accounts grow? How do you keep it fair and aligned and not disaligned with your customers? Yeah. So we, we changed our pricing about six months ago. Um, okay. The old pricing we had for two or three years was just linear, scaled forever. And it was really just kind of the first guest pricing we had put out. You know, we hadn't. Who'd you copy? It. Did you have a? Did you have uh, something you emulated? No, we didn't really copy anyone. I kind of did some literally back of the envelope. I think it was on a napkin at a cafe, and then <laughs> just slapped it on the website, and then it worked well for a couple of yeah. years. And I was like, okay, like yeah, that's fine. Um, we changed it because it was linear forever, and we wanted to be able to give volume discounts over time, which is just the standard in SaaS, right? You know, yeah. higher volume, you get you get a price cut as you grow. Similarly, with well, some products contracts. get more expensive. As you some grow, do, but keep some going. Do. Yeah, but yeah, it depends. Some do. I think pricing is ultimately a question around like, you know, value that you're getting out of it. That's that's the biggest thing at the end. And as you build more and more product, the value of what you offer changes. You yes. Know, hopefully to become more valuable and not less over time. You're not getting commodified. But it, it, to me, it's actually beyond that. It's all about incentives. Like, are your incentives aligned? For work OS, we charge effectively based on the number of enterprise customers you have, how many organizations you're selling to. And so you start paying for WorkOS when you're taking down logos. When you're when you're closing deals, you pay WorkOS more and more. And so okay. we only win when you win. And I think that alignment of the incentives actually means it's, it's kind of the ideal form of pricing um, for any product. And is there something specific? This idea of volume discounts, we all get it, but I'm not convinced there's as much science there as we think. It's a, it's a tough A-B test to run. Did you, did you have an insight on how to, when you... When you flattened your curve, it sounds like, right? With volumes, did you, was there a methodology that you employed or did, how did you figure out what the right way to do that was? We looked at a bunch of different signals, um, you know, because I yeah. think for, for technology like WorkOS, you could assume it's just the upfront engineering cost, which is which is a lot to build something like that. Like we've spent years and years and years doing yeah. with, with like a lot of engineers. Um, but what I realized is, is there's this ongoing maintenance, which actually we could quantify a bit as we grew and as we kind of supported more and more customers. So we factored that into it and then kind of said, okay, here's more or less what it'll cost you to build in-house and keep investing in it. And so we'll charge you a fraction of that, right? It's, it's definitely going to be below that as a company and help you accelerate. But, uh, the thing that's the most exciting to me though, when I talk to customers, I sit down with them and I say, Hey, how many enterprise users do you not have today? Cause you don't have this feature. How many deals? Yep. Could you not close? How valuable would it be for you to close those customers next week instead of next year? Let's quantify that right now because the time to market is kind of that's almost impossible to put a price on. You know how yes. fast? To well, you are, and you're up. aligning to revenue in that conversation. Totally. Let's right? get that's, you that's a huge the thing win people may Let's you, blow out your numbers. Yeah, right? you may be selling to developers, but you're aligning your 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 value prop is that let's help you close more deals now. Like that's what work revenue, really right? is. That's what it really is about. You yeah. know, it's 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 sample and skim and audit logs and all this stuff. But really, what it is about helping your business succeed faster. We won't help you get product market fit. We won't help you design your product. But once you get that. Once you're there, we will certainly help you scale. We will yep. certainly help you go up market and do it in a way that's like, you know, to the people on the other side of the table, the IT department skeptically looking at your product, we will check all the boxes so that they can say not just yes, but like, hell yes, let's get this in. Cool. All right. Two more quick things I wanted to get from you. One very high level one, and then one very granular. High level, we're all trying to read the tea leaves today. What are you seeing at a quote macro level today? What are you seeing overall in the market? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it, WorkOS is an interesting product because we can see all the growth of our customers in a way because we're charging them based on it, right? How many organizations yes, they're on Yes, your derivative effect of that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, tide goes up, tide goes down. Um, we are seeing companies that were growing well last year continue to grow and do really well, um, continue to have, you know, put up good numbers and expand and, and bit, have people that had robust, healthy businesses. What we're also seeing is there's some companies that I think had problems with their business model or, you know, had sort of like leaky funnels that didn't show that they needed to get patched in the last few years that are now having some serious issues and needing to, needing to, to grapple with those. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's good for people where it's good and it's, it's tough for people where it's tough. Um, we're seeing more and more companies built around AI stuff. And the, I, I think what's really exciting about the AI stuff is it's so commercial focused, you know, it's not consumer yep. focused. There's real business value there. And so we're seeing that, that to start growing and expand. But, um, I think what, what I'm just generally seeing is even though there's been sort of this market slowdown or downturn, it hasn't really slowed down SaaS innovation and like everything around the, the kind of constant proliferation of ideas yes. um, that we've seen in the last few years. It's still just as just as incredibly fast and hard to keep up with <laughs> than it has been before. Yeah, it was interesting. I was just catching up on Zscaler. I was writing up on, on Saster and obviously an incredible security business, right? Uh, 1.5 billion in revenue growing 50%. And what they said is, look, our numbers are still pretty good, but our sales cycles are still longer. Um, and we have to position every deal as mission critical, right? And there, there we're talking about cybersecurity and, and, and trying to avoid these horrific, <laughs> horrific attacks. But their point is, every, even for us, every deal, we've got to position it as mission critical, and then we can close it, but it's got to be mission critical, right? And I, I, I suspect you're, you're in that zone, right, um, in terms of the problems you're solving, but you're at the, you've got to put that into the conversation to close deals, I would guess. Yeah, for us, we're helping companies close deals, you know, yeah. because of that. And I, um, what I've actually seen, kind of funny enough, is there's people that want work with us even more. They went into 23 saying, hey, we can't just coast off our, you know, bottom up kind of consumer revenue. Well, the bar has gone up to, for selling. The bar has gone, gone up, up right? and we need to go after enterprise. Yeah. For so many companies, their enterprise roadmap and their enterprise focus has now become a priority. Previously, yeah. it was a nice to have. Now it's a must have. WorkOS is the answer to that. Um, it's a good so, point. That's one of the bars that, it, that we talk about less that's gone up, right? You can't just skate on this stuff anymore. You can't right? wait to do enterprise. Every sales like you harder, were saying, right? you got to do it at the beginning. You can't wait until you're... 10 or whatever to figure out your enterprise story. Yeah. You got to have that story in the first year. Okay. La very last one, very yeah. specific to the company. What, um, what feature or feature like product are you rolling out in the next six to 12 months that you're personally most excited about? What are you most yeah. excited about? That's yeah. Coming down so the bike? it's a great question. There's a ton of stuff we're working on. I mean, work is always, one. yeah, work <laughs> has always been a multi-product company. And so we have a few things yeah. already. And you know, it's, as if there's one thing I get excited about, it's future products. Um, <laughs> Uh, so a lot of what we've done to date around authentication for SSO and enterprise authentication has been to help, help companies sign in at the, the biggest customers that you might, your biggest customer you might go to ever. Um, and we've done really well at that and helped a lot of companies. Like I mentioned, some of the, some of these ones, um, accelerate up market really quickly. What our customers are asking us to do is actually to do the whole stack for them. They're like, Hey, I don't want you to just do auth for my enterprise customers. Yeah. I would like you to do it for everything. I'd like you to do it for all the users and help me even like optimize my sign up, you know, and registration and joining a team and the security of just the, the top level funnel, which is really the, the, the core authentication experience of their app, the sign in box. And Got that's it. something that, you know, auth zero, I think has done a little bit of, you know, like from yeah. the early days. But if you think about the login box of your app, it's one of the most important pieces of an entire product. It's like the front door to your your application. You know, it's the thing that every single user touches. When there's friction touches. there, I just want to pull my hair out. When, when, it's, when there's everybody, there, right? everybody touches it, everybody uses it, and yet yeah. it's it's code that's usually written once and people forget about. It's this unloved corner of the app. You know, it's, you yeah. don't get promoted by working on the login box. You know, at a company that's been around for a while. Well, yeah, and so in, in my shop, you do. But no, I, yeah, it's go. a very good point. But it's, it's a big not touched often enough. Really impactful it's not place. Touched often enough, really right? impactful place. And so we're gonna you know do some work around that. We have, we have some stuff coming that I think could dramatically change the performance that people have around that and experience for their end users. It's a it's a huge opportunity that's just waiting there. And we've been thinking about it for uh, for a long time. We've been working on it for a long time. Um, and uh, fingers crossed, we'll we'll have something shipped soon. <laughs> cool. Hopefully about Saturday. Excited. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, Michael, this was great. Thanks for, I, I learned some good things. Thanks for, thanks for catching up. Um, and uh, congratulations on the 400 customers. We're looking forward to 4,000. Hey, thanks a lot. Me too. Someday. All right. Talk to you soon.